All right, so the day has finally arrived. We've talked about it for a long time on Channel 9, about a, a series focusing on algorithms, something all developers know and love, whether they realize it or not. So without further ado, we're going to begin this off with the great Yuri Gurevich, who's a logician and computer scientist and knows a thing or two about algorithms. Thank you for coming on, Yuri. Excellent. Thank you very much, Charles. Great to have you here. We also have a virtual audience. Hello, virtual audience. <laughs> Hello, live audience. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. It's, it's, it's a big honor to start Channel 9 series of alg on algorithms. Um, let me try. So here is an agenda for today. So here is the algorithm. We have two integers, A and B. A is at least large as B. So we have this pair, and we keep updating it. So for example, if we start from pair 33, 12, then we subtract 12 from 33, so we get pair 21 and 12. Then again, we subtract smaller from the larger. We get a pair 9 and 3. So the larger one goes first all the time. You keep doing this until the numbers coincide, and then you output any of them. They are equal. And this way you get uh, the greatest common divisor. It's, qu it's quite a sophisticated algorithm. It always terminates, because as you go, you descend. Interestingly, Euclid had another form of that same algorithm. But this time, it worked not with numbers, but with straight line segments. And today, we, might think, we may think that it's really about real numbers. You have two real numbers. Again, uh, the first one is at least as large as the other one. But the notion of real number didn't exist at the time. And so the, the way they g got around this difficulty, they thought geometry. So they, th they thought about segments of a straight line, and two segments considered congruent if one of them can be moved to coincide with the other. And the notion of congruence plays the, uh, plays the same relation as notion of equality on natural numbers. And then the algorithm proceeds in the same way. There is, however, a little problem. It may or may not terminate. So two segments called commensurable, if there exists another segment for such that each one of the original segments can be obtained from the third one by repeating the third one integer number of times. Okay. So this, is the, this third segment is the common measure. So if there is a common measure, it's commensurable. And if the two numbers are commensurable, then the algorithm finds the largest possible common measure. However, they may be not commensurable, and it was a discovery that the Greeks made. For example, if you take um, a square and take a side and a diagonal, then the two are not commensurable. And the algorithm will run forever, in principle, So, let me do a few remarks. So, these days there are different versions of that algorithm. For example, instead of going slowly by subtracting smaller from the larger, we can use division. And use algorithm which is exponentially time faster. Another um, remark I will 
sort of uh, alluded to, that today we would work with real numbers. Now, the objection to real numbers, it's not only that the notion didn't exist. I think they probably would resist having this notion because real numbers is, where are they <laughs> in, in, the, in the real world? So it's a kind of matter of philosophical discussion and the difficult, different philosophical school may agree or disagree on the existence of such ideal objects. Whereas um, segments of straight line is something which definitely exists. And the notion of congruence is quite quite obvious notion. And so, so they found quite an elegant way to get around it. The algorithm had been hugely generalized and in fact today we understand, we as, as a community, mathematicians understand exactly where it works. So there are so-called Euclidean domains, special kind of algebras which um, um, the, the natural most general way where this algorithm, general domain where such an algorithm, where Euclidean algorithm runs. Uh, there is a very sophisticated and very interesting analysis of the running time of the algorithm in Knuth's The Art of Computer Programming. One other interesting question, which is sort of related. So if, if you go to, to the sentient Greeks, they always work with ruler and compass. And you say, didn't they understand that there are other things? You know, ellipses, hyperbolas. Why, why it's always ruler and compass? And they actually did understand quite well that there are more sophisticated uh, figures than straight line and circle. However, they didn't have a good means. They didn't have a computer which would allow them to deal with those more sophisticated shapes. So ruler and compass was actually their computer. That was something they could actually use. So if you go and you, a piece of, on a piece of land, you, you can actually do your computation. So it was, it was a, a very applied math at the time. Yeah? So it always was this kind of physical act of, of, of doing something like, I mean, when you, when you ask, if you, like, you could you know, bring Euclid back and ask him about his algorithm, he, did he think about it in lines or you know, was, he, was that kind of a, the, they were thinking in these physical objects in this kind of geometric space more than this kind of abstract number idea? That is my impression, that he, they really thought about segments. Mm -hmm. And then you consider um, congruent segments indistinguishable. So today we would say that the congruent segments represent the same object, which is their length. But I believe for them it was really about the segments. And this notion of congruence was extended from um, segments of um, straight line to triangles and more complicated shapes. <laughs> Let me make a, a kind of side remark, not exactly <laughs> a part of uh, Algorithm theory. There is a very interesting book by historian and I suspect also mathematician, judging by, by the book Lucio Rosso, Russo, The Forgotten Revolution. So the point that uh, Russo makes is that science is fragile, the scientific method itself. So it was not invented according to him. It is somewhat controversial theory, but he is not an extremist coming with you know, outlandish ideas. So this idea may be indeed very brave, but it's certainly a mainstream uh, expert. So according to him, the, the scientific method was invented in Hellenistic times. 
and existed and was flourishing for a few generation, generations, and then was circumstances changed, and eventually it was lost and forgotten. And in times of Renaissance, it had to be regenerated. So today it may seem to us that scientific method is so powerful. People swear by, by science. But in fact, it may be lost. And it was lost. And it says, certain, gives certain responsibility to scientists to keep up the flame. Let me consider another algorithm which also works not with uh, numbers but with um, sophisticated objects, in this case continuous curves. So you have a continuous function um, and you have two points, A and B, and the task is to find, as they say, the zero of the function, to find a point where the function is zero. Now that is in general impossible to do algorithmically, but what is possible to do to find a sufficiently close uh, approximation. So we start with um, two numbers, a and b, such that f of a is less than f of b, and some positive, presumably small number epsilon, and our goal is to find a point in, in the domain of f where the, the value of f is by absolute, the absolute value of f of b is less than epsilon. Okay. And this is so-called bisection um, algorithm. So what do you do? You find the median point and if f at this median point less than epsilon, you're done. The median point is what you want. If not, you move one of the extreme points to the median. So, which one? So, in this case, the, here is the median. And what we want that on the extreme points, f has different signs. Okay. So, in this point, f has the same sign as the original b. So, we move b here. On the next step, when we find the median, it turns out that at the median, f has the same sign as a, so we move a here. And though we keep going, and a theorem about continuous functions, the, the, the notion of continuity guarantees that this pro process converges, and algorithm terminates and produces a, de a desired point. It's another uh, example of an algorithm. So now let me bring one classification of algorithms. So there are digital algorithms, so common today. So we saw one Euclid's numerical algorithm, the standard high school algorithm for multiplying um, positive integers is digital. Anything you program in C, C Sharp, or Java, or whatever is your favorite language, is digital, and today it seems like algorithms are digital algorithms, and very often people implicitly presume that algorithms are digital. But in fact, there are non-digital algorithms, and those can be classified further. So we saw two. One was geometrical algorithm, why it's not digital. Imagine you want to do it and see how you, you take a segment of real line. Now, you cannot put it into your <laughs> into, you, uh, uh, input to your com computer, to your program. Um, another example, we saw this um, bisection algorithm which works over a given continuous function. And again, that continuous function is not something you can put into your program. 
um, you, you can ma maybe approximate those algorithms, but it's a separate story. Another interesting, uh, various algorithms on real, on genuine reals, a kind of infinite precision. So, for example, Gauss elimination procedure er, or various al al uh, algorithms with matrices, mm -hmm. with the real number of matrices. Okay. Now, all these algorithms have common feature that they still have the notion of a step. So they are sort of discrete event systems. So the data is continuous, or maybe continuous, but time is discrete. And then there are algorithms which work in continuous time, so-called analog algorithms, electrical circuit, mechanical gyroscope, so um, engineers outside of com <laughs> computing still in various areas study those algorithms. Say this mechanical uh, gyroscope is a very interesting algorithm. Go ahead. I guess um, maybe I missed something, but I, I didn't really understand why the, um, the, con the continuous function algorithm wasn't digital. Digital. Because I could imagine programming that, if you will. The question is, how is continuous function given to you? So the number of continuous function is infinite. And therefore, there is no way you can present continuous function as is. What you can present, um, if this continuous function has an algorithm to compute it, which is not necessarily true. So there are continuous functions which you just cannot compute. Now, if this com continuous function is computable, then you can, g given um, say an, an approximation to the input, you can compute an approximation to, to the output. Mm -hmm. But there are continuous functions which do not lend themselves to, to such approximations. There are just too many continuous functions. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So. Um, and so by, but to get to the continuous time algorithm, the analog ones, by electrical mm -hmm. circuits, do you mean like kind of, you know, if I have like blinking Christmas tree lights, is that kind of more yes. of like a, that's like a... Yeah, exactly. So it, it's not zero, one. If you, if you, if, if you measure, say, voltage, it, it goes continuously and, and takes all kinds of intermediate values. Mm -hmm. And then there are hybrid algorithms. Um, for example, a robot, it may use some analog um, <clears throat> algorithm, some physical process to guide his movement, and then it hits, say, an, uh, a wall, and then maybe it computes something, <laughs> what to do next. Mm -hmm. And so, so the digital and non-digital parts uh, are present, both. Okay, so now we go to new section. <laughs> so from antiquity to, let's see, so we, we uh, um, jump over many centuries, and a lot of progress was made. Initially progress was rediscovering what the Greeks did. Mm -hmm. One a very important progress made uh, unfortunately, it's not <laughs> something I prepared and didn't look up. Uh, it might have been Vieta, uh, uh, one of the mathematicians of Italian Renaissance, who invented symbolic notations. So if you, if you read Greeks, uh, it's complicated. Uh, they, they, they don't use symbols. So they ex explain it's um, in a kind of lengthy and long-winded long way. So that was, um, inventing those notations was quite revolutionary. And agreeing on those notations is um, sort of part of our civilization. As we grow, we develop common conventions. 
So, for example, uh, equality sign was invented consciously. So the idea was what can be more equal than two segments of straight line of the same length. So that's equal. Now C language uses equality for a different purpose. That's a, a bit destructive. <laughs> okay. And so there was a, a lot, a lot of um, progress and eventually we come to year 1936 when uh, somebody called Alan Turing, oops, his name is not on this slide, but it will be on a number of next <laughs> following slides, wrote this paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidung problem. Okay. So the paper is found on, on this uh, br British uh, website in a very beautiful form. It's actually much easier to read it there than, than in, in, in the journal. And you may wonder what, what's this Entscheidungsproblem that we will eventually return to it. Now, what did Turing do? So he analyzed uh, digital algorithms. And so what I'm going now to do, just to replay his analysis. Um, so if you are going to actually read his paper, um, it, it's a kind of genius who not necessarily sticklers uh, uh, for details. In fact, in a year he published some correction and made some, but it doesn't matter. It, it is just this very convincing flow of thought, which um, overwhelming. So I would start with, with a much later quotation from uh, another giant of 20th century uh, Russian mathematician Kalmogorov, who posited that algorithms compute in steps of bounded complexity. So that sheds some light on what Turing's do. Of course, it's a posteriori light, but still it's kind of useful. So the, the way Turing proceeded, so he wanted to analyze an arbitrary computation. And he said, how do we do computation? It's 1936. So the computer is, uh, I think he used the word man, so the man computes. And how does the man compute? So he has paper, he writes something on paper. So here he writes, computing is normally done by writing certain symbols on paper. Sounds very, very general, but notice also that it's a restriction to digital computers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now he says, okay, so, so in, with this beginning, it seems, how much can you do? Okay, you look at, at a man or woman writing <laughs> symbols on the paper, how can you possibly analyze this? And that was the genius of uh, Alan Turing that um, he saw a way to do it. So he says, okay, of course you can write symbols any way you wish, but probably you will do the same job if we agree that the paper is divided into squares. Uh, I think he says like an arithmetic book for a child. Okay. And you write one single per square, one symbol per square. Mm -hmm. It seems obvious that well, it's a little bit, um, kind of maybe <laughs> accurate is kind of, you don't expect from normal people to, to be <laughs> so accurate, but we can do it yeah, if, if, if necessary. 
then he said, okay, it, paper is in general two-dimensional, and maybe you do, did something here, you want to go there, but without loss of generality, we can always imagine that you went there in a kind of long way. You return on, on all the lines. And so in principle, we can imagine that the paper is one continuous tape split into cells mm -hmm. or squares. And we write a symbol per square. And of course, you can want to go for, forward or backward. Now, different symbols should be very visibly different. So the idea of a symbol, it's something that you grasp at once. It's not that you study. So if you have to study, then you probably have to split this something into, into simpler symbols. Therefore, there are only so many symbols. Okay. Maybe you use Latin and Greek alphabet and, and such and such symbols, uh, you know, addition, multiplication, and so on, but only so many. Now becomes a very interesting point, and that connects to steps. Mm -hmm. So the idea that this, is, this computation is sort of mechanical. It doesn't involve creativity. You, don't think about yourself as you know, you know, talented painter doing what comes to your mind. No, you execute very mechanically something. Okay? And for example, you can um, go answer a call and come back and continue. Or even you can leave few notes and another human computer comes and continues from the same point. So he says that if you consider any such a state of computation, then in that state, what, what is the state determined? So whatever is on your paper or tape, and whatever is in your mind. Okay. Now again, it seems, what is in your mind? How can you possibly analyze <laughs> what's in your mind? Psychology or what? But Turing says uh, it, it can be analyzed because it, it's, the computation is mechanical. Okay? So you can be, as far as this computation is concerned, you can be only, o in only so many states of mind. Okay? So first let me read this. The behavior of the computer at any moment is determined by the symbols which he's observing and his states of mind. Notice this, his. <laughs> yes, that's the um, human computer. Yeah? So you say it's more a mechanical computation. I mean, this is somebody like adding in numbers or multiplying numbers and not somebody who's like, you know, like a physicist, like staring at, at equations and trying to like do theorems, things like that. It's much more of kind of a this follows from this, follows from this kind yes, of. Yes, yes, yes. You, you carry out computations in, in accordance with, with some algorithm, with, with some program. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have two long integers and you multiply them. Okay. And so you do it very carefully, but you know exactly what you are doing. Okay. And so if you are stopped in the middle of computation, then Oh, first of all, there's this uh, the whole tape, but currently you are staring maybe at this symbol, or maybe at these two symbols. Okay? And maybe you just did this, and you remember the carry, uh, the carry, the carry, which... But there is only so much to remember. So suddenly, if you're interrupted, you, you, you can write down, okay, that's where I was, so look what is it on the paper, and here these symbols were in the center of my attention, and I had in mind this carry, and that's it. So in, in that sense, it's mechanical. Mm -hmm. Mechanical in the sense uh, not involving creativity. Mm -hmm. You just being a computer executing certain program. Yeah. And um, so there are more restrictions. 
You say, how many symbols can you see at once? So, first of all, symbol is something that you grasp immediately. Now, at once you may see maybe, you know, five symbols. You know, you know if you're very good, maybe you may see you know, 17 symbols. But there's a certain bound. Because if you see in the sense that you know exactly what you're seeing, so you can repeat, you know, it's like you copy it and you can paste it in somewhere. Right, like I can, I can look at two two-digit numbers and just add them right away in my head, but if you give me two 17-digit numbers, right, right. I'm going to take it two at a time. <laughs> exactly, exactly, let alone if I give you 100 digits yeah. number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you look at <laughs> like, Okay, let's start at the ones. And <laughs> exactly, right. Similarly, we can imagine that the number of states of mind relevant to this computation is only finite. For the same reason, because if there were too many of them, you would get confused where you are. But this is presumably a very clear procedure where you know exactly where you are and you proceed with this. So he continues his analysis. Now, what do you do? So, for example, you may change this symbol into that symbol, or you write a new symbol. But altogether, there are only few things that you can do at one step. Because if you, for example, if you have to write a, a, a number of 100 digit number, you probably will do it, you know, one by one or, or two or you know, maybe groups of three, de depending on how good you are, but doubtful you will write them all, all at once. And uh, essentially, ah, so we continue, we may suppose that in a simple operation, not more than one symbol is altered. Because if we alter five, then we can split into five even more elementary operations, where you could alter each one of them separately. So you, at a, any given time, you alter at most one symbol. And uh, you, without, again, without loss of generality, you look at one square. Because if you look at three, again, we can split this process into s smaller pieces. Notice also that in the process, we lower our level of abstraction. <laughs> but if we lower it enough, eventually we, at each computation step, deal with one symbol, and one square. Mm -hmm. And what we can do is very little. He says we can rewrite the symbol, we can move to the next square, we can to the right, we can move to the next square to the left. So at this point we essentially arrived to the computation model known today as uh, the Turing machine. So let me summarize what uh, Turing did. So he introduced um, a very simple computer model known today as, as uh, the Turing machine model. He argued very convincingly that every mechanical computation can be compiled into an appropriate Turing machine and then carried or executed by such a Turing machine. I say convincingly argues rather than proves because uh, you can only prove something when you get, when you deal with purely mathematical objects. And here he, he winds up with a mathematical object which is a, a Turing machine, but he starts with something vague and amorphous amorphic, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you cannot prove a theorem about this, but you can argue, and that, that is a wonderfully convincing argument that he gave us. He also proved a theorem there, actually more than one, but 
One of them is this. He constructed a problem. A problem is this. You start with a Turing machine, a Turing machine, and give it certain input, and you ask, will it halt eventually? Will it, the computation terminate? And he shows that there is no other Turing machine which taking this Turing machine and its input as its own input is able to decide whether the original Turing machine terminates or not. So we have a kind of given Turing machine and then kind of meta Turing machine. So there is no such meta Turing machine which can look at the given machine and its input and in finite time decides that uh, this original Turing machine halts or not. So this became known as the halting problem. He proves it by the diagonal argument invented by Cantor, Georg Cantor. A few months before Turing's paper, so Turing was uh, in Oxford, a British fellow. He was an American, Alonzo Church, who conjectured, conjectured um, a very close thing. He conjectured that every, mathematically, every mechanically computable function from integers to integers can be programmed in a very particular uh, theoretical programming language. So for our purposes here, it's not so important. So there is a kind of theoretical programming language. Uh, actually had two, and he proved that they both have the same power. Whatever you can program in one can be programmed in the other. And, um, and that's what his, his conjecture. Turing learned about, about that um, after submitting his paper and quickly proved that that programming language and Turing machine systems are essentially uh, equivalent. So each one of them can simulate the other. Mm -hmm. So in fact, they spoke both about the same claim. George wrote um, a review of Turing's paper, and he started, it is an independent work, which was not so obvious, so he was uh, a gentleman here, because formally speaking, Turing was his student. <laughs> so George was in Princeton, Turing in Oxford, but nevertheless, he kind of formally was a student of, of Alonzo Church. And uh, Church had his own interesting arguments, but he did not have such a uh, convincing analysis that uh, Turing gave. So I have a whole lecture uh, which I gave once at uh, Microsoft Research and it's other places in Google, and it's found on my website. <laughs> it's all about the story. Of people involved and um, in general logicians look pretty good there are no na nasty things and <laughs> they said only only good things about each other so that that uh, conjecture became known as church turing thesis or church turing's thesis so now back to this entscheidungs problem what is this Entscheidung's problem? So it's a German word meaning decision problem. So what's a decision problem? So imagine a, a series of inputs. So for example, I give you two numbers, two integers, and ask, find their um, product. So such a, 
a mass problem called decision problem. To solve it means to find an algorithm which solves all the instances. So, um, Okay, let me make a little correction. <laughs> so I described a little too general. So the decision problem is um, that kind of mass problem. You are given input, but the answer that you expect is only yes or no. Okay. So for example, I give you number A and number B, and I ask, is it true that B is a power of A? a square, a cube, a to the k, the answer should be yes or no. That's kind of decision. That's what decision problem is. You decide. Okay. But the idea is not to decide for one particular input, but in a way decide for all inputs. And the meaning is to find an algorithm that in every particular case can answer the question. And the particular decision problem that they were interested in was related to logic. So the first order logic, the standard logic of textbooks, was just formalized by the time a Church and Turing worked. And the question arose whether it can be decided sort of mechanically. So is, suppose I give you first order sentence. You know, for all x, there exists y, such for all z, something. Is there a general way, an algorithm, which, given such a sentence, tells me whether the sentence is true or not? And why is it important? Because a large part of mathematics, not just a large part, but almost anything, can be formulated in these terms. Fermat conjecture, Riemann hypothesis can be formulated in these terms. So if there was such an algorithm, and especially if it were feasible, then you don't need mathematicians anymore. <laughs> so they were really looking for, I guess, kind of this like uber, like this kind of very high level algorithm that you could just throw conjectures and mathematical theorems at and would just come back and say yes or no? Yes, exactly. That's, I that. want that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very <laughs> ambitious. And um, the, the, the um, problem was posed by Hilbert, another giant of 20th century mathematics. And when Hilbert posed the idea was just find that algorithm. And maybe it's very hard, but maybe you can find for special cases, and then you will continue, and so on. But by the time that uh, Church and Turing worked, there were some clever people, like von Neumann, that started to doubt that there is such a thing. And of course, this includes Church and Turing. So, which not only doubted, so Church stated uh, this is a conjecture that there is no such algorithm. Mm -hmm. Or more exactly, he, st he st stated conjecture that I mentioned earlier, and then proved the theorem that if we accept his conjecture, that the, then there is no algorithm. That would be a theorem that there is no algorithm. So the decision problem for first order logic is unsolvable. And so that problem was, at, at the time, the center of attention of logicians, and everybody was interested in it. And both Church and Turing worked on their, what we call now, theses, trying to solve that problem, the Scheinlux problem. And the way they solved it, they formulated something which is seemingly true, 
like a new axiom about the world, and if we accept that, then e uh, e um, each one of them proved formally that there is no algorithm for um, deciding for an arbitrary first order sentence whether it's true or not. Was Turing's disproof the his? Is it the same as the halting problem? Was that like kind of his his disproof of this, or is it first he pr proved halting problem undecidable, and then he showed that in this logic you can speak about halting problem, and so if there were algorithm for the first order logic, then the same algorithm could be used to solve halting problem. Okay, it's like a proof by contradiction. Like I can uh, by reduction. By reduction. Okay. Yeah. He reduced halting problem to Schrodinger's problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that became uh, very popular. I remember that from my computer science classes. Of you know, <laughs> well, that's the halting problem, so you can't solve it. <laughs> right. So and then there were. Inter oh, okay. then there was Second World War. Nothing much happened in logic, <laughs> but uh, in late 40s, things started to tick again. So one, um, one area was that by the time Church and Turing came, there was a lot, a lot of effort toward solving this enchanting problem. And the efforts were of two kinds. Let get an algorithm for different fragments. So more and more bigger and bigger fragments for which we have an algorithm. And then there were algorithms in, in the opposite direction. Let find an, a fragment and prove that if there exists an algorithm for that fragment, then there is an algorithm for the whole first order logic. Okay, the second, the first fragments were called decidable. The second were called reduction classes. You reduce the whole thing to that fragment. Mm -hmm. And people try to narrow this. And typically, you know, a priori there is uh, uh, continuously many fragments. So the standard, there was a kind of standard form for those fragments. Okay. And uh, for some people it's a pure historical interest. For me it was quite uh, personal because I caught the, the very end of that. <laughs> Even though Church and Turing proved that the whole thing is undecidable, now it turns out that those fragments which used to be called reduction classes now became undecidable and people wanted to understand um, which fragments are decidable, which are not. And so this, there was a classification for the standard classes on which many people worked. So it was like, we can't, we can't have the whole pie, but like, can there be some slices that like, you know, are there, are there certain first order logics that we can decide? Or we can... Fra fragments of that logic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for example, you consider only state sentences of the form for all x, for all y, for all z, for all, for all, for all, for all, and then something without any quantifiers, without for all or exists. Mm -hmm. That would be... Or for all x, there exists y, and then something without quantifier for x and y. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I was uh, studying, s starting my career in this and uh, put the last uh, um, brick into this standard classification. much bigger uh, activity was in studying various mathematical theories. So people say, why, why only pure logic? Let's start, for example, arithmetic. And people proved that integer arithmetic is undecidable. This is all if we accept the Church-Turing thesis. But the thesis quickly gained acceptance. 
And in the beginning, people would say this is undecidable if we accept church Turing thesis, and then all these reservations were thrown out and just people would speak about undecidable and that's it. So integer arithmetic was proven undecidable. Rational was proven undecidable. Real arithmetic was proven decidable. Seems, how come? This is a richer field. But this is a first order logic. You can speak only about for all real numbers there exists a real number such as for all real number. You cannot say for any subset of real numbers because otherwise you would immediately uh, reduce uh, rational or integer arithmetic to real arithmetic. And if you look at the history of mathematics, you will see that this extension from integers to rationals to reals to complex numbers were introduced in order to simplify things. For example, polynomial of degree n with one variable has always n roots. Well, some of them are multiple, but in principle has n roots here. Now, and how many roots it has here, it's, it may be very, very hard to decide. And so, so the, often the decidability and real mathematical understanding of the, of the theorem went hand in hand. You push one and you advance on the other. So that's very interesting time. And a lot of progress has been made. And a whole direction of mathematics uh, evolved called constructivism. So I know best uh, the Russian school of constructivists, probably at the time the largest and um, arguably most influential. The origin of this movement goes back to Holland, to famous topologist Brouwer. And but the thesis sort of changed the attitude of these people. And um, so he, here I, I describe their system as an outsider. So from their point of view, the functions are computable functions. There's no other thing. So they thought digital, and they thought about finite presentation. If something doesn't have finite presentation, it's a myth that doesn't belong to mathematics from their point of view. So th they would argue that classical mathematics has a lot of stuff which makes no sense. Okay, so suppose you prove that for, for every x there exists y, but you don't provide any algorithm which given x finds y. Then What's the point? So it's sort of true, but how can you take advantage of it? Okay. That's their arguing. Okay. I'm not buying, but <laughs> but that's what. what uh, in fact, I have on my website a, a critique of uh, <laughs> constructivist because what what happened the um, dispute was rather monotonous, the constructivist spoke, and classical mathematicians didn't care much. <laughs> and so eventually, I wanted to give a voice to the classical, mathemat to classical mathematics, and took a picture from one of Russian fables, where an elephant walks and a little dog jumps and jumps on it, and, <laughs> and elephant just doesn't carry it, <laughs> doesn't make any noises. But in any case, uh, so from, them po from their point of view, functions are computable functions. And computable means there is this mechanical procedure, that there is an algorithm that produces that number. Only those real numbers exist which are computable, others just don't exist. Okay. So you asked the question about uh, why can't we program uh, that bisection algorithm? And I said, because um, a continuous curve it may, may not 
lend itself to digitization even in approximate way. But from their point of view, such curve just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Or it exists in some platonic world which of no real interest to the real world. And from their point of view, only such reals exist, only such uh, continuous functions exist, which we can compute. For example, this, from their point of view, the statement for every real x, there exists an integer y such that something, means that there exists an algorithm which, given this real x, and real x may be given by a program that computes a, uh, more and more digits of it, produces an integer y such that this property phi holds. That's their attitude. Okay. So let me go back and just summarize where we are. Okay. So we had a glance on antiquity. We spoke about digital versus non-digital algorithms. And then we spent a lot of time on Church Turing thesis. And then computability and decidability. And so now I want to devote a few slides to critique. You know, it's easier to critique uh, a posteriori. Let me go to the place where we were. Okay. So it is common to think about algorithms as something that Turing machines do. And that point of view is way too restricted. So first of all, there are non-digital algorithms, as we saw. Okay. So some of them allow good digital approximations, some don't. Then there are algorithms of a different sort. Uh, let me explain this algorithm. It's very mechanical. So every morning at 8 a.m., you take a bucket and put it in your balcony. Open balcony. Okay. At the end of the day, say 8 p.m., you bring this bucket and measure how many grams of water is there. Okay. Round down. You get some integer. Okay. Depends where you live. So you have zero, zero, zero. And if you live around here, it will be not zero, not zero, <laughs> not zero. <laughs> but you have certain sequence of numbers. There's no reason to believe that sequence is computable. And it's produced by a very mechanical procedure. Mm -hmm. And there is no way to approximate it. At least, um, it's hard to believe that there is a way to approximate, unless you have you know, <laughs> some kind of agreement with <laughs> powers <laughs> above us. But it's clear what goes on, that this algorithm interacts with outside world. Whereas mechanical algorithm we discussed earlier, it was a kind of implicit but now we have to bring it, they are non-interactive. They just compute on their own. Okay. And so this particular problem can, can be actually solved by generalizing Turing model, and it was solved that way, by providing an oracle to Turing machine. So essentially, what you do is completely mechanical. What comes from outside, this is essentially an oracle. But it's important that there are non-Turing algorithms. Uh, in this golden age of solvable versus unsolvable problems, or in special case, decidable, undecidable. So solvable, there exists an algorithm. Decidable, there is an algorithm that gives answers yes, no. Mm -hmm. So this is more general. In this golden age, uh, there was somewhat naive 
as we understand now, um, expectation that if you have an algorithm, you can actually use it. The reality is that you may find an algorithm and program it in Turing machine form or in C, but it will run for a long, long time, <laughs> longer than um, this planet system exists. <laughs> so in, in what sense this algorithm exists or terminates? Um, one example, not so extreme, I mentioned that real arithmetic is decidable, and Alfred Tarski, uh, to a great extent uh, the father of uh, American logic school, mathematical logic school, proved, found that algorithm. He proved the de decidability of the of uh, real arithmetic, and he produced real-world algorithm. It turns out that his algorithm, which is, um, mathematically speaking, very, very clear and very satisfying, but um, it is uh, no, worse than exponential, worse than double exponential, worse than triple exponential, <laughs> and so on. So I could write a program that could solve all, that could decide all real arithmetic, but I wouldn't live to know, find the answer. <laughs> no, that, that was his particular algorithm, because okay. at his time, people don't, didn't care that much. Sure. It was just existence of algorithm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in this particular case, it turns out it's very hard to bring it down to earth. So a lot of very clever people made very interesting, uh, um, progress in this area, and still we don't have a really feasible algorithm. If we were, it would be very, very helpful. So maybe eventually we will, but we don't. And we don't know the exact lower bound. Mm -hmm. Now, so solvable problems may be not very well solvable. On the other hand, the unsolvable, so you may think unsolvable is something absolute. We prove there is no algorithm. But what does it mean there is no algorithm? It means th there is no algorithm which handles all cases. In reality, what may happen is that the difficult ca cases are very few and far in between. And so in your typical situation, we can just solve it. And so there's a lot, a lot of progress, but I want to mention one particular uh, progress. Uh, well, it's, it's a guy from Microsoft Research. <laughs> so, so nice to, uh, to mention a, a peer. But I mention it mostly because it goes back to the original indecidable problem of Turing, the halting problem. So, in fact, Byron has a tool called, he calls Terminator. And if you give him your C program, in most cases, he does find out whether your program terminates or not. So, <laughs> so he solves the, the halting problem. Using a Turing complete language. Yes. <laughs> so, just to call out to Byron, he's been on Channel 9 a few times and also went to Evergreen. And now he's at, uh, anyway, I got to call that out. Okay. <laughs> right on. Yes, I think it's uh, an excellent fellow of uh, Channel 9. <laughs> uh, now, if we go back, um, back to Turing model, so this is not critique of Turing. <laughs> you know, he made such incredible advance, but nobody solves all the problems of humanity. <laughs> so, and then, as they say, you stay on shoulders of the giants and continue to improve things. So, one problem with a Turing machine is that it's very, very low level. 
So in reality, if you have an interesting algorithm, by the time you compile it to Turing machine, first of all, it becomes incomprehensible. <laughs> Second, I don't know any good Turing machines which we can actually buy and run. In principle, you can build, but you know, imagine you multiply two large matrices. So there's language like PL1, which will multiply two matrices like that. And the poor Turing machine will work very painfully along this long tape to the right and, and to the left and to the right and to the left. It, it just too long. So eventually, um, people came up with the better models. And uh, one of them was invented by um, Andrei Kolmogorov, whom I mentioned earlier. And his model was more realistic. And one example to it is he had uh, a logic seminar in uh, at Moscow University. And he asked his people, there is this algorithm for multiplying integers, which we all know. Is it the best you can do? And I guess the expected answer was sure, but how to prove it. And some of his people came with better algorithms. Turns out you, you can do, what does mean better? Uh, you, they're not that much better that you want to teach them in high school, but they have shorter running time. Mm -hmm. They run faster. Uh, so this Kolmogorov machines were not very well known and very similar, slightly more, um, possibly more powerful. It's actually an open question. <laughs> uh, um, model was invented uh, on the West. So Knuth starts, I, I'm not sure he set up to invent a computation model, but when he set out to write his art of computer programming and analyzed algorithms, he needed somehow to count steps, and he didn't want to count steps of Turing machine. It's, it's just not very <laughs> realistic. So he wanted to have a machine which sort of, a theoretical machine that works as, as computers of our time. And he invented his machine that he explains in the very, very beginning of uh, the art of computer programming. So independently, uh, a German uh, mathematician, uh, Schonhage, investigated this model more theoretically. S a similar model, not this one, similar model. Uh, very close. And very close to Kolmogorov machine model, it is slightly more advanced. It, it, this, their machines can do a little more. But, uh, so Kolmogorov machines are sp sort of special case. And it is still an open question. Maybe Kolmogorov machine can simulate um, without delay, without losing complexity, without um, worsening complexity. And later, um, Tarjan, okay, knowing this development, came with even nicer form and gave it name pointer machines, and that's the name stuck. And so this is a very popular model, well investigated. Uh, yet another more advanced uh, model called random access uh, machines. And uh, one even more advanced model goes to this speaker. And there are many, many models in the literature, some of them specialized. And it's not that I don't want to speak, but that will take me far away. And then there will be no way to bring me back to it. <laughs> OK, this is my last slide. So the, we ended. Uh, finished with the critique. Ah, let me let me add one.
something else which I forgot to say. <laughs> there is a, con a little confusion. And this goes to back to that slide. People often think that the problem the church and Turing solved was formalizing algorithms, to answering the question, what an algorithm is. And that is not the case. Because Turing machine is so low level, it's rather, from Turing's point, here are two theses are different. Um, but Turing provided a kind of very low level implementation for any algorithm. You know, algorithm may be very sophisticated and live in a very abstract world, but what Turing said, uh, digital algorithm, <laughs> that you can always compile it to Turing machine and in principle execute using Turing machine. Mm -hmm. Church said, and both of them said, that if you take any computable functions from natural numbers to natural numbers, if it's computable by any algorithm, digital algorithm, then it also can be computed by a Turing machine or programmed in Church's programming language. So it's kind of like he set up like the, like the stacks of abstractions that kind of we all depend on nowadays where like, you know, we have the, the machine code that's running, but then, you know, people wrote an assembly and then they wrote in C and C++. So they kind of proved that you could build this stack and if, you know, as long as you were computable from this to this, I can prove that you can get down to a Turing machine. Right. And so... Now, the, the, yeah, that, that's exactly it. And, but the interesting problem remains, what is an algorithm if we want to understand it as is? Not what can it com be compiled to or what algorithm can, what functions can algorithm compute? Because not every algorithm computes a function. And not every algorithm is supposed to terminate. You know, operating system is an algorithm. You don't want it to terminate. <laughs> You're not so happy when it does. <laughs> so, um, and that's a sep separate issue. And suddenly, th this speaker devoted it years of <laughs> The time and um, it's a, a separate lecture <laughs> if, we, if we are interested. Of course. B but there is something else that Turing machine provided. In Church's approach didn't. The Turing machine has steps. And so when you execute, you can count those steps. And therefore, it opens a way to speak about time, running time. Because how do you measure time? You know, if, if a man computes, you know, how do you measure the time of the, of the algorithm? It depends on how quick that man is. <laughs> and there are so many factors to take into account. But with Turing machine, we can abstract from all kinds of things and just count the number of steps from the beginning to termination, if ever. And that is the running time. And so now we can compare. Mm -hmm. And so when Kolmogorov asked whether you can do faster this integer multiplication, what he was asking, a very precise mathematical question, can you find a program now, I mean, in his case, for Kolmogorov machines, such that the number of steps we can find an algorithm which spends, takes less number of steps to solve the problem than the uh, standard algorithm. Similarly, you can count the number of um, squares of the tape, and then gives you kind of storage how much storage it takes. And here you have a space complexity. So before Turing, there were attempts to measure things in terms of electrical circuits, the size of the circuit. But real computational complexity started with, with the Turing model. And until these days, 
in, people speak. Uh, it turns out that for many purposes, you can count on Turing machines or on some other machines. So, so if you count, uh, um, depends how closely you want to know the number. And mm -hmm. in, in theoretical, for, for certain theoretical purposes, Turing machine is still sufficient. And so that's the beginning of computational complexity. And eventually it became a big, big world. And so we, we benefit and something to speak about <laughs> in future. And so one question, I, one question I would have is the Van Neumann, you mentioned him briefly. Mm -hmm. Um, the modern computer, what's the relationship between the modern computer and Van Neumann? Ah. And then we can get into the parallel thing, which we'll probably do <laughs> later. But our computers are still designed on this stepwise thinking. It's causing problems for those of us in software. But can you talk about Von Neumann? Yes, yes. So actually, there was something else that, that Turing did. And I could have mentioned. Um, probably should have mentioned, but, but, but I didn't. And that is that Turing designed also a universal Turing machine, which can simulate any other Turing machine. So suppose I have a Turing machine A, and I give to this Turing machine some input. Input means the initial tape. And, and where I suppose I'm in the beginning of the tape. Okay. Suppose tape is one way infinite. Um, then, now if each Turing machine has a program, which is a finite text. So if we give to the universal machine that program and that input, then the universal machine can run this machine A on that input. So that's the universal machine. And that idea is very much present in von Neumann architecture. And they all somehow were related to Princeton. Church was there, <laughs> a professor in the university. You know, by the way, Einstein was there in, <laughs> in the institute. <laughs> and Gödel, the famous logician, yeah eventually came there and worked in that institute. Uh, probably the most famous of, of the logicians of 20th century. It, and, um, and there is a kind of open historical question, to what extent Turing model was known to von Neumann and inspired von Neumann architecture. Now, von Neumann is a very cle <laughs> clever human being and proved himself uh, very visionary. And he was one of those people who realized, he didn't come with thesis like Turing, but he definitely realized in road, in before, I think in the early 1930s, uh, something that it doesn't stand to reason that there is, you know, one algorithm that solves all problems in first order logic. So it seems sort of clear to him. He wasn't clear how to approach this problem. So it is entirely possible that he came to the idea of universal computer himself. Because that, wa that was the, the big deal about von Neumann architecture. So in Germany, there was this fellow Zeus, if I uh, pronounced correctly, his name also came er early with the electronic computer. But, I hope my facts are correct. And so it, it was uh, very earlier an independent uh, co computer, but it, w it wasn't universal. And having universal computer is a very big deal. It means that you can program anything. And in the beginning, it was somewhat controversial. There were people, you know, I'm a chemical engineer. No, von Neumann is not. So why should I use von Neumann computer? Maybe I should use a special, you know, chemical engineering com computer. 
and should be better. And so there were attempts to, to, to come up with specialized computers. But it turns out that this universal computer is better and it won completely. So there is a very close connection between these very theoretical ideas published by Turing in uh, one of journals of London Mathematical Society and very f engineering stuff that was produced uh, in, in this country in the 1940s. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And we'll continue, hopefully we can continue the conversation and explore algorithms again. I think it's beautiful that you didn't define what an algorithm is. <laughs> because that's implicitly what's so excellent about this journey. It's a word that's so poorly understood. It even sounds weird. <laughs> so, it's, I mean, it's, it's, this is beautiful. I thought this, this was nice. Thank you. So thank you for your time.